from Villanova University and a DDS degree from Columbia. He completed residency in oral and maxillofacial surgery at the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Turvey is an American board certified uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon, a fellow of the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery and of the American College of Surgeons. He's a founding member of the American Academy of Cranium Maxillofacial Surgery and an associate member of the European Association of Cranium Maxillofacial Surgeons. Dr. Turvey has published more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and has authored several textbooks, among which the Benchmark Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery textbook, together with Dr. Fonseca and Dr. Machani. He has lectured in more than 35 countries on six continents and is the recipient of numerous teaching and leadership awards. It's an honor to have you both on the virtual podium today. And our moderators from the Anglo Society of Europe are Professor Nazan Kukukoles from Istanbul, an internationally renowned craniofacial specialist. And the Angle East moderator is Dr. Dan Tangi from Saint Jean sur Richelieu in Canada. He is a superb clinician and a past president of Angle East. So, without any further delay, please, dear Caroline and Tim, we are all eyes and ears. Thank you so much, Uta. I, I see Dan Tangi here, and um, I can't, I don't recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, and let's get the presentation up. So let's go. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a few things. There we go. Um, again, thank you for the gracious introduction, Ute, for on both behalf of both of us. Um, what Dr. Turvey and I uh, were pleased to have this opportunity to present to you today. Um, uh, let's see, um, as part of this update, what we'd like to do today is provide you with the most contemporary treatments and philosophy of care for patients, for these patients, um, and within the context of the more current or established treatments. Just a, a few acknowledgements um, here, disclosures. In the time we have, which is limited, what we're gonna do is focus our talk on the treatments of patients with cleft lip and palate with one or two exceptions towards the end. We just don't have the time to go into all the craniofacial anomalies, et cetera. The talk though presupposes that you know the, some basics of cleft lip and palate. So these patients tend to have a multitude of problems that require a number of specialties to coordinate their care. With that in mind, the goal of treatment is to achieve as normal appearance and function as possible in these patients without the need for a prosthesis. We would like to have optimum facial and dental aesthetics for these patients to provide them with a low maintenance occlusion. That's one that is free of periodontal defects and any planned prostheses. And for them to have at least 20 teeth, we would like to ensure that we provide care or treatment that is based on the best possible evidence that we have. You know, in this patient population, uh, many different treatments pop up over time and we don't have the sample sizes to truly evaluate them, but we do our best. And we'd like to limit the burden of treatment, especially in a population like this where patients have many procedures starting in infancy and with luck ending in early adulthood. As we go through the presentation, it's peppered with different um, references. Obviously we can't, it's a court of what we state. We can't uh, reference everything. So the way to achieve excellent results is with carefully coordinated treatment by the surgeon and orthodontist and the team of specialists, okay? Now, in certain instances, these specialists may have competing outcomes. So for example, the speech pathologist would very much like to have every, all the surgeries, the surgeries completed early so that the speech function can begin. On the, other, on the other hand, the orthodontist might like to delay some of these surgeries, surgeries so that we can enhance craniofacial growth. And over the years as specialists, we managed this very well by agreeing to compromise and to intervene at the most appropriate time to optimize speech development, craniofacial growth, and other treatments. 
so that I said, we are going to give you the most contemporary care within the current context of treatments. That is treatments currently available. So um, these are the different times at which you might intervene, okay? Soon after birth, the child may have infant orthopedics. And that is in preparation for the lip repair, which tends to occur around three months of age, give or take a few months. Then the palate is generally repaired before one year of age. And then patients may have secondary palatal surgery. These are things like pharyngeal flap surgeries, and that's variable. And generally that's about five years and older. Then they go on to have bone grafting, okay? So you have to put something in the alveolus, bone preferably, to allow the teeth to erupt. There are two types of primary bone, types of bone grafting. There's primary, which is before one year of age, and then there's secondary, which can occur somewhere nine to 11 years of age where you're grafting for the canine, or if you decided to go earlier, six to seven years of age, where you're grafting for the lateral incisor. Now, obviously, if you've had a primary bone grafting, you shouldn't need a secondary bone grafting. And Tim likes to refer to, to, to talk about delayed grafting when he talks about secondary grafting. We'll go into all of this. Most centers don't do primary bone grafting. Um, the standard of care is mostly secondary bone grafting. And then with the bone grafting, there's usually a phase one of orthodontics where you go in and you line the teeth up, maybe do some expansion. And then you get out and allow the permanent teeth to erupt go back in for a second phase of orthodontics uh, where you complete the treatment if growth has been good. If growth has not been in your favor or in the patient's favor, and generally they tend to have a mid-phase deficiency developing because of the effects of the palate repair, you will need to have some sort of orthodontic surgery associated with that phase two orthodontics that occurs in late adolescence. And finally, we come full circle again because one of the most challenging things that we have for the surgeon is the lip uh, repair and the subsequent scarring that may occur that may need patients to have a lip revision, which can occur, occur any time after the initial lip repair. So let's look a bit at a patient that, oh, what I wanted to tell you here is that while this, this is in general, and I actually tell the residents, if there's one slide you want to remember, it's this. Not all centers will follow this, but you can modify it accordingly for your particular center and their timing of treatment. So let's look at an ideal patient. Patient, Tim's that came in at age six, this young boy. You can see he has a nice full face, nice convex profile. Facial features are well balanced. That's good because we know the effects of the palatal surgery will cause the mid face to flatten. And so this patient most likely will not ever need orthognathic surgery. The occlusion shows mild collapse of the posterior segments. And again, the CEPH shows nice full face. When you look at the pan, what you see is a large defect in the area of the cleft here. You see the canine developing and you see there's a lateral. Now, that lateral, if we want 28 teeth at least, you have to graft soon for that lateral to erupt. It is high in the cleft. And so you will have to graft, if you want to save that tooth, you have to graft this area at this time. If you do not graft, and if this tooth comes into the cleft without before grafting, what you will have is a periodontal defect. And that is you, you're not going to be able to get resolve that once that tooth has erupted. So at the very least, you have to graft before this tooth erupts into the mouth or when the root is two thirds formed. And that's what was done for this patient. Most importantly, after you graft, you must, the orthodontist must get in soon after and line these teeth up to create space for the cuspid to erupt. And there you see that's exactly what was done. Here you see him at the end of the grafting. And at this point, you know, he, he pretty much at the end of orthodontics overall, and he looks very nice. Here he, again, this is the, um, his Ceph and Panorex. Dentition looks good. And here he is a little later in time. He has a 
satisfactory, satisfactory function. He's got a well-balanced face. He's got good lip projection, nice support to the nasal base, minimal scarring of the lip. And in animation, he looks really good. But you know, some of our patients are not so lucky. So with that in mind, we, we should remember that when a child is born with a cleft of the lip and palate, the growth potential of the face is at its best. Everything we do from then on, such as our surgeries and orthodontics impedes midfacial growth to the extent that somewhere between 25 to 60% of cleft lip and palate patients, depending on what articles you read, go on to have orthognathic surgery. Okay, so let's talk about these different treatments. Let's talk first about pre-surgical infant ortho orthopedics. This is a procedure that is done to assist the surgeon with the lip repair. The clinician uses various intraoral and extraoral types of appliances to mold or align the alveolar segments prior to the initial surgery. The claimed advantages are that at the completion of infant orthopedics, the surgeon is able to perform the surgery with tissue that is under less tension and also with the bony facial structures that are closer to the norm. And these advantages are supposed uh, will help to minimize scar tissue formation and other complications. So for example, in this um, unilateral cleft lip and palate baby, this is the greater segment and this is a lesser segment of the maxilla. The frenum is somewhere here. You can see it's off to one side. Our appliances mold these segments around, this particular greater segment around to make it more symmetrical and so that the surgeon has a more symmetrical bony base, a more normal bony base in which to perform a surgery. And of course, it will decrease the gap. With the bilateral, what we do is we have a plate here and what we're doing is we're moving this premaxilla back to where it normally should be. So the repair occurs under less tension. These are some nasal, nasal molding appliances. This is um, these ones at the top here, uh, modified um, uh, McNeil appliances, whereby you, they're active. They do put pressure on the segments to mold them around. And again, here you have a plate that's in the mouth in this little baby, and then you rig up this sort of elastic traction to retract the premaxilla. These down here, this is for the unilateral and this is for bilateral. These are pin plates. This is the latham appliance. This is one is for the unilateral. This one is for the bilateral. And essentially what's done, it's pinned in place. And in this instance for the unilateral, you turn this screw and this moves this greater segment round to the lesser segment. And this setup retracts the premaxilla. So what is new here? Well, it's not really new, it's what's newer. And that's a nasal alveolar molding appliance. And I understand you had a, a talk about this. Um, the nasal alveolar molding appliance, the major difference between this appliance and the other infant orthopedic devices is that in addition to molding the alveolar segments, it molds the ala cartilages to improve symmetry of the cartilages and it lengthens the columella. Many patients with cleft lip and palate have a shortened columella with a depressed nasal tip. Anything that lengthens the columella will greatly improve the facial aesthetics. Technically, you should complete this, these, these, the infant orthopedic treatment soon after birth, that is within the first six week of, weeks of life as the tissues have increased plasticity. Now, this is a patient of a colleague, Pedro Santiago at UNC. And you can see this is a bilateral cleft lip and palate patient. This is what the NAM device looks like. Here you have a plate and you see some acrylic here. And what he's doing is passively, I call it passively, but maybe active, but he's molding the segments used by adding acrylic. But most importantly, you see these nasal stents with acrylic at the end. When in place, these stents sit on the inner corner of the sill, nostril sill here on either side, serving to lift the nostril nasal tip up. And actually, as you keep adding acrylic, 
you kind of mold the columella as well as the, cart the ALA cartilages as well. Okay, here's this baby just before the lip repair, but after the nasoalveolar molding. And you can see the symmetry to the cartilages and the length of the columella. And here he is at six weeks after the lip repair, repair again, the cartilages and the columella, and at four years, the columella and the cartilages. You could see whether it stands up or not. So when you think about this, is the NAM necessary? Pretty much, I would say infant orthopedics has been controversial from its inception to now. It's still controversial, okay? Um, the NAM itself is very technique sensitive and there's a learning curve for the clinician. When you look at long-term outcomes, long-term outcomes, you should ask how long? I just put in a few articles here and you can see there's several patients that, um, that they did evaluations at three years, nine years, 12 years, et cetera. What you find, it's, it, it goes back and forth. Some people think it, it, it makes a difference others don't, okay? Um, it's very difficult to evaluate though, and, and that's the issue. And is 12 years the appropriate time to evaluate this? I might say not, I might say later adolescence. I call your attention to this particular article, which um, you, know, you should look, you should read. It's by Kornblut, uh, it was in 2018. And they, interestingly enough, did an intercenter comparison and they looked at the Latham appliance, which I showed you, um, the modified McNeil appliance, which I showed you, and the NAM, okay? All of which we discussed. They evaluated these patients. It was a cross-sectional study somewhere between six to 12 years. So it's a one-shot thing. And just to show you the complexity of the outcomes, um, they said the Latham appliance plus early revision surgery, lip revision surgery, improve the nasal aesthetic outcomes. This may be nasal surgery as well. The NAM appliance without early revision surgery may lead to improved nasal aesthetic outcomes. But they said there was a cost. Both the Latham and the NAM impeded maxillary growth. I want to bring to your attention that lots of confounders in this, and that's what makes it so difficult to do these evaluations. There are other problems with the NAM it demand, demands a lot of cooperation from families. Um, it's costly. Uh, it requires compliance, as I said, and there's an interruption of family life and child and parent bonding with this because it's, too, it's very labor intensive. Nonetheless, we tend to say if the surgeon needs it, we do it. However, the verdict is still out. And now I pass this on to Dr. Turley, who take give you his take on the NAM as well as discuss these early surgeries for lip and palate repair and secondary palate surgery. Dr. Turley, please. This is a, a two-year-old who was recently um, brought to the United States from China by her adoptive parents. And obviously she has a very large bilateral cleft lip uh, and palate. Um, we felt that it was important to make this child as socially acceptable as possible. And so we elected to proceed with um, surgery without any type of orthopedic intervention. As you can see that premaxilla is ectopically positioned and it's quite asymmetrical. Um, trying to use a NAM appliance or any type of orthopedic appliance with a two-year-old child uh, would certainly be a, a significant challenge. With the infant, at, at least they're unable to get their hand up to the mouth in a purposeful uh, fashion to pull, to pull these devices loose. On the other hand, a two-year-old has some dexterity and ability to displace those appliances. So we decided to proceed with surgery that would certainly require significant undermining um, in order to achieve adequate outcome. But we were, we were going to rely on the tension from the lip closure to help uh, reposition these segments rather than to try to reposition them with orthopedic devices prior to surgery. Next, please. Uh, 
So we proceeded with surgery. Uh, we performed a, a lip closure with her. Keep in mind that um, primary lip surgery is really a chylorhinoplasty. It, it's not just lip closures. So we're dissecting nasal cartilages to try to uh, achieve as symmetrical a result as is possible. We're going to use tissue from the prolabium to elevate up uh, into the calumella, and we're going to join the lateral segments across uh, at the midline. Very importantly, we want to perform muscle reanastomosis, specifically the orbicularis uh, oris muscle, uh, in order to achieve a well-functioning lip um, in addition. So the, the post operative photographs that you're looking at are approximately six months following her lip closure. So that would be about two and a half years of age. Next, please. So as you can see, we can wind up with a, a relatively good looking lip, good vermilion uh, match and, and uh, minimal scars that are concealed nicely in the filtral columns. Next, please. Now this, keep in mind, this was done without any orthopedic uh, devices or NAM. Next, please. So in terms of primary chylorhinoplasty, the points that I want to emphasize are things that Jean Delaire and uh, Roberto Brusati from Milano uh, emphasized for their entire life. Uh, and that is the importance of muscle reconstruction. The exact soft tissue incision that you use is not as important as the um, paying attention to reanastomosing muscle. It must be identified, it must be released, it must be re uh, repositioned and sutured together. Next, please. So we want all of the elements uh, of the lip to be joined together, but very importantly, it, you must appreciate cleft anatomy. What you're looking at are some illustrations of the distortion of the insertion of the orbicularis oculi or the orbicularis oris muscle in a cleft patient. It is not joined at the midline. The cleft is a defect that penetrates all tissue levels. The muscle is abnormally attached to the ala rim uh, on either side of the cleft. Very importantly, this muscle must be uh, dissected from its abnormal attachments. It must be freed up well enough to be able to stretch across the cleft defect and approximate it. At the same time, attention needs to be paid to dissecting and skeletonizing the uh, lateral cartilages, especially on the cleft side. This is something that uh, Talmont and Brusati uh, really ha have, have called to people's attention uh, and the importance of it. Next, please. So most people will use some type of incision design that employs what's called rotation advancement. This is a technique that uh, was described um, uh, by Ralph Millard and popularized by Millard. Uh, Asensio in Guatemala also uh, was a very early advocate of this procedure. What it does is it allows you to lengthen the lip on the cleft side, and then to advance tissue from the lateral segment into the uh, elongated medial segment uh, to achieve appropriate lip length and to wind up with decent vermilion attachment. Simultaneously, the orbicularis oris muscle is dissected. Uh, all, all three of the bundles can be identified and sutured together. This technique requires a significant dissection of the tissues along the lateral segment up to the infraorbital rim and posterior to the uh, infraorbital uh, foramen. Next, please. Cartilage dissection is very important. 
there have uh, nasal cartilage uh, dissection is very important to help with columella lengthening and reformation of the uh, supporting ala cartilages. There have been many modifications made to the original rotation advancement um, flaps, uh, uh, but these I consider to be minor uh, uh, modifications uh, that can be employed if additional length is needed to the columella or additional reduction in width is needed uh, to, the, um, to restore appropriate uh, ailer anatomy. Next, please. The importance with, uh, with the, the two most important things with lip closure are freeing up of the abnormal muscle attachment, reconstruction of the orbicularis, and dissection of the nasal cartilages with attempts to restore as symmetrical nasal, uh, nasal anatomy as is possible. Next, please. What I want to emphasize here is the importance of the nasal cartilage dissection uh, um, where the, the cartilage, even across the dome of the nose uh, is skeletonized and then inserting the scissor as you see in uh, illustration F2 up through the lateral segment and complete dissection of that cartilage will help uh, mold it into uh, a better position. Next, please. Now, this is a bilateral uh, cleft, which is uh, a more difficult situation to deal with. But again, the principles are the same. It's going to re require uh, a closure of the lip, but very importantly, uh, reconstruction of, of the uh, nose at the same time. With the bilateral cleft, of course, we're going to want to elongate the cayumella at the time of surgery. We want to uh, create a narrow premaxilla, uh, as you see illustrated in, in the um, uh, photograph on the top screen. And, and then we, we want extensive dissection of the muscle. We want to reconstruct the orbicularis uh, oris muscle, bring it underneath the prolabium, tie it together, and then advance the lateral uh, uh, cheek tissues towards the midline to achieve closure. Next, please. This will also reduce the width of the um, uh, ala bases. Very importantly is muscle dissection and getting the orbicularis uh, oris bundles together at the time of surgery. Next, please. So as you can see at the completion of surgery, we've successfully constructed a cayumella uh, where we've used some of the tissue from the prolabium to elevate up into uh, the cayumella. We've reduced the width of the nose uh, inferiorly by rotating those lateral flap inward. We have reconstructed a decent Vermeian junction for the child. And importantly, we are using external bolsters to help mold the position and configuration of the ailer cartilages. Next, please. So initial uh, primary palate repair is normally delayed until the child begins to speak. It's going to require elevation of mucoperiosteum from the palate and therefore uh, we, it, we know that this will have an untoward effect on child's growth. There's no reason to repair a palate prior to when the child uh, needs the palate. The primary reason for uh, palate repair has to do with speech. A child does not need a palate um, uh, to be able to swallow. The most common type of procedure that we use in the U.S. is a two-flap palatoplasty, uh, as described by Janice Bardock. Very importantly, and I want to emphasize this, is levator muscle reconstruction, paying attention also to the palatopharyngeus muscle and the palatoglossus muscle. We like to, in most centers in the United States, we like to close both the hard and soft palate simultaneously. Uh, 
So we want to elongate the palate at the time of closure. Next, please. The critical aspect of palate repair is to put the sphincter together, put the velopharyngeal sphincter together. The abnormal anatomy in the cleft patient is seen on the right side with the abnormal attachment of the uh, palatal uh, glossus, palatal pharyngeus, and importantly, the levator muscle into the hard palate. We need to re release that levator muscle uh, and move the um, uh, muscle bundles posteriorly. And at the same time, we're going to elongate the palate to help achieve a sphincter that functions well. Next, please. Sometimes flaps can be elevated from the vomer to help facilitate this. Other times it's going to require elevation of flaps from, from the palate itself. The critical thing is the levator muscle reconstruction and elongation of the palate simultaneously. Next, please. So at the time of surgery, we want to separate the nasal mucosa from oral mucosa, and we want to extensively dissect the levator muscle, which is abnormally attaching into the posterior aspects of the hard palate. We want to release entirely this muscle bundle and join it in the midline uh, achieving posterior displacement. Next, please. So we use a three-layer closure. Um, we're going to close entirely the nasal mucosa. We close the muscle layer, and then we need to close the oral layer. The section of the uh, uh, descending palatine or greater palatine neurovascular bundle at the time of surgery will help with mobilization of the palatal flaps, posterior displacement and medial displacement of those flaps so that you can achieve primary closure at the time of surgery. Next, please. Now, secondary repair of cleft palate is going to be required in about uh, 30%, 20 to 30% of the patients who have a palate repair done primarily. The only reason to perform secondary palate repair is if the child is velopharyngeal incompetent or if, if there are fistulas. Posterior pharyngeal flap is pro probably the most predictable um, flap relative to uh, reduction of uh, um, nasal speech. However, what we realize today is that a posterior pharyngeal flap is very obliterating and it can result in the development of obstructive sleep apnea, even in young children. The double opposing Z-plasty uh, has been popularized over the last decade um, by furlough. The uh, a Z, adding a, a, a Z flap to palate repair was originally introduced by Schuchard in about 1942. Um, uh, and a third way of dealing with this is the sphincter pharyngoplasty as described by Otto Gochia and by Heinz. Next, please. So, about 20 to 30 percent of patients with repaired cleft palate will benefit from further surgery to address hypernasal speech. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the superiorly based posterior pharyngeal flap is probably the most predictable for reduction of hypernasal speech, but um, it, it can be associated with the development of sleep apnea. The tissue is harvested from the posterior pharyngeal wall. It's superiorly based well up into the adenoid area. And the tip of the flap is then inserted into the hard palate and covered with the soft palate uh, and allowed to heal. If you look at the slide on the lower left, you can see the effect of that. It obliterates the nasal pharynx 
uh, and it leaves two small nasal oral orifices on either side of the flap. Next, please. The um, uh, sphincter uh, palatoplasty is uh, another procedure that can be done uh, when the defect is smaller. The tissue is harvested from the lateral pharyngeal wall, uh, as well as with some of the palatopharyngeus muscle. Uh, it's elevated high up into the nasal pharynx and sutured across the posterior pharyngeal wall. And this helps reduce the size of the uh, nasal pharyngeal orifice and helps improve speech. This, this procedure is a predictable procedure for smaller defects. Next, please. Keep in mind that none of those flaps, by the way, are dynamic flaps. Um, they're all static flaps. Hey, thank you. Um, Tim, um, my, my preference uh, is that the lip and palate repairs are nailed at the first attempt um, to avoid any revision surgeries because repeated surgeries um, lead to scarring of both the lip and palate makes things a little bit more challenging for the orthodontist, both from expansion and tooth movement perspectives and ultimately aesthetics. Okay, so now you've got to this point, you've got to the bone graft area, you've repaired the lip, you've repaired the palate, and um, we need to graft for teeth to erupt. As I said to you, a procedure, which I will talk about just briefly, the primary bone grafting procedure, it's not done at many centers. And it, um, it was started initially in the mid 60s, 1960s. And the orthodontic community followed those patients that had primary bone graft. And what they found was it was detrimental to facial growth. So they abandoned it in favor of secondary or delayed bone grafting. Um, <clears throat> it made a reappearance in the late 70s to 18, 80, 80s um, with the Rosestein and Kernahan procedure where they actually put rib into the alveolus. I don't think anybody is doing that now, but what people are doing uh, still are the gingival perioplasty is the gingival periplasty. And just to let you know what that is, a brief description, um, what they do here is they don't actually put bone in here. What they do is they make a tunnel, they line that with periosteum. That's what the surgeon does. Of course, you get bleeding into that and over time it changes to bone. In a nutshell, that's what it is. Um, I just highlight this one um, uh, reference here by Wang and coworkers. And they did a, an out, out, compared outcomes of gingival perioplasty and secondary or delayed alveolar bone grafting. They had about 25 patients in each group. What they found is the patients that had gingival perioplasty had more residual cleft defects and needed additional bone grafting. Um, clearly, if you have to do that and do additional bone grafting, your primary bone graft has failed. Um, Tim, do you wanna mention anything here? Yeah. Um, it Torx Skoog is credited with first describing this procedure. Uh, uh, Skoog was from Malmö uh, in Sweden, and he formed the, this uh, 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 tunnel with, and lined it with periosteum and then filled it with surgicel, which is just a material, a sur surgical material that will dissolve and uh, eventually form some bone. Um, the 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 problem is not that the procedure is, is bad, but the problem is that almost all of the patients who will undergo this procedure will require additional bone grafting to support tooth eruption later in life. Um, there are a few centers that report that they do this and have excellent results, specifically Brusati in Milano. Um, but for most centers, the they admit that they have to come back and put uh, bone graft in at an appropriate age consistent with tooth development. Okay, so now on to secondary or delayed alveolar bone grafting. And that's generally done with a phase one of orthodontics where we sort of initially do some expansion align the teeth. For any form of bone grafting, alveolar bone grafting, the goal is to create an intact maxillary arch with favorable facial and dental aesthetics. We'd like to provide support for teeth adjacent to the cleft. 
close any oronasal fistulas, elevate and support the nasal base, provide a continuous alveolar ridge, and in the bilateral, stabilize the premaxilla. So here's a nice um, a, a, a ideal, another ideal patient. He's got a nice full face. Um, he actually has a cleft of the primary palate and partially cleft of the secondary palate. He has mild collapse of the posterior segments. And if you look in here, this is a panorex before grafting, you see the cleft area. This is the canine that's erupting because the incisor is missing. And what you want to do is you want to time any ortho treatment that you're gonna do, expansion or whatever, and he doesn't need any, um, such that you graft when that root is two thirds mm -hmm. form, that's ideal. If you do not, and that tooth erupts into the arch, you will have a, a periodontal defect. And you don't want that. You won't be able to get rid of that. The very latest, latest, you should graft before this tooth appears in the mouth. Another thing is you should wait to align the anterior dentition because you don't want to have any problems with this root here. So you should align the anterior teeth post grafting. Here he is post bone graft. You can see a strut of bone across here and that canine is poised to come in and the orthodontist has lined the dentition up. And of course, at this point, you want to get out. You don't want to do, um, you want to give him a, a rest and fit some retainers and allow the secondary dentition to erupt. Now, what is new here? It's not really new, it's newer. And that has to do with the timing. Obviously, the timing is not dependent on age. It's dependent on dental development, the timing of that root, okay? Earlier grafting um, is, is sometimes done and it, it could be done, time for the eruption of the lateral incisor and even the central incisor, if it makes sense. And here you see that first ideal patient that we grafted for the lateral incisor. And you see that here, we maintain the 28T. And this is a study by Dassault and coworkers where they compared grafting at these two time points. They had 14 patients grafted at nine for the canine and 14 at five to six years for the lateral incisor. They used CBCTs to analyze the graft volume before and six months after grafting. And they found a higher success rate for bone grafts placed when children are operated earlier around five years. The point is you can do this, it's not a problem. This is another one of Tim's cases here. This is a post graph. These are post graph records. Here you see the central incisor, the permanent incisor erupting. But on this side, side with the cleft, the, the deciduous incisor is in place. And here you see her post graft where bone has been placed into the cleft area to allow the central incisor to erupt. So this is going even earlier. All right. So now I told you that we do phase, um, different phases of orthodontics, in this case, a phase one of orthodontics when we do the bone graft. You can either expand before the bone graft or after the graft. Most of us expand the, before the graft because it's easier, okay? And so technically easier for the orthodontist when we do that. Where the disadvantage for the surgeon is that we sometimes tend to overexpand. And therefore, it requires more bone for the surgeon and more soft tissue. And it eliminates post-graft stimulation. Um, it turns out that that expansion can tense the graft and enhance it. Um, I, I just draw your attention to an, another sort of technical difficulty for the surgeon, particularly in the bilateral, if you overexpand, there is tends to be a step between the premaxilla and the posterior segments. And if you overexpand in addition to that step, it makes it really technically difficult again for the surgeon to do that grafting. Um, and uh, again, this is a fan type appliance. Uh, you don't have to use this. You can use a trihelix or quad helix to do your expansion. What about expanding after the bone graft? Well, here you see the graft is in place. You don't have any uh, bone here, so that's easy to expand the, the secondary palate. But now you have an intact alveolus. So what you're doing, um, if you do rapid palatal expansion, you're splitting the incisal suture. You probably are getting some, some expansion in the site of the graft area. And so it's not only helping make the graft viable, but making 
putting tension on it as you're doing that expansion. The point is you can do this as well. You can expand after the graph. One thing I'd like to talk about just briefly is the bilateral. When you look at the bilateral patients, um, if you follow them from six years, say, to, uh, to early adulthood, what you find around 12, 11, 10, 12, 13, they have a very protrusive premaxillary area. And that's good if they do, because what happens is as they continue to grow, as the mandible continues to grow, as the mid-face deficiency kicks in, they tend to finish with a more flattened profile and again, without requiring any orthognathic surgery. So that protrusion is good. You want to avoid any sort of premaxillary osteotomy in that region in that, at that time when you graft, because sometimes um, that looks like is what you should do because the premaxilla is protrusive. If you do that at that time, you may tip your patient into an orthognathic surgery patient. Now, there are times when you need to do it, as in this patient here, with a very vertically elongated premaxillary area, and it's unsightly. Just call your, your attention to this article by Bitterman and co-workers, and they looked at the management of the premaxilla in bilateral patients. They looked at several, um, they did a literature review of about 16 articles, and they too confirmed that when you did this, the midfacial growth was negatively affected. But again, I come back to this patient that you have where you really need to do something. And this is Tim's patient. Here you see the extreme um, vertical elongation of that premaxilla. Turns out, if you're gonna do this, you want to lift it up vertically, but not set it back. There's some indication that if you vertically reposition it without setting it back, it's it doesn't affect the midfacial growth. And here she is, you know, in the splint after this at the time of both grafting. And um, this is a paper from Verity and Long, and they looked at um, maxillary growth with following surgical premaxillary repositioning and secondary alveolar bone grafting in bilateral clefts. And what they found was for most of the patients that vertical repositioning only, um, if they had that, the growth continued at the same rate. So I guess you can do it, but just do it vertically. And here she is at the end of treatment and um, no need for maxillary advancement. So Tim, over to you on the bone graft construction. So let, let me just make a comment about the, the vertical repositioning of the premaxilla. When that is indicated, uh, it, the technique has to be done very, very carefully, preserving uh, all blood flow coming into the pro uh, or the premaxilla. It can be done simultaneously uh, with, with the placement of a bone graft. The important thing is that the premaxilla be kept out of occlusion during the healing phase. An occlusal splint is a great way to do that. Uh, or putting stops on the molar teeth that would hold the bite open. It, the, the important thing is that the premaxilla be completely out of contact, contact with the mandibular arch to help promote healing. Um, it, this is a patient, uh, this is age 25. I operated her at age seven. So this is a pretty pretty long follow-up. And the point I want to emphasize here is that the orthodontists have been able to uh, bring her cuspids forward uh, to substitute for the missing lateral incisors. Absolutely no need for prosthetic rehabilitation. Next, please. Now, a, a few things that I want to talk about uh, relative to constructing the cleft maxilla and palate and these require emphasis, this is not alveolar bone grafting. A cleft through the maxilla and palate is just that. It, it, um, it ascends above the level of the alveolus into the floor of the nose. Uh, almost 100% of the time, there will be oral nasal fistulas. These fistulas have to be closed at the time of surgery. The way to do that is to use the uh, lining of the cleft, um, strip it uh, in a subperiosteal fashion, and elevate it up to help re 
construct a new nasal uh, mucosal covered floor. The tissues are sutured into place and then the bone graft will help support that nasal floor. Uh, I'll show you in just a few minutes how we insert a little piece of cortical bone to support that soft tissue closure. Um, bone must be completely stripped on either side of the cleft and then fresh autogenous cancellous bone is placed into that defect to help facilitate closure of the fistula and to help facilitate construction of the maxilla. And then the final phase of this is to rotate some tissue in to cover over the grafted bone. Next, please. So it's important to understand cleft anatomy. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is not just a hole through the skin. This is a, a tissue deficit affecting all planes. All the time with facial clefts, the bone is going to be affected as well. You'll notice the typical cleft anatomy is the absence of the nasal floor on the cleft side, the absence of the inferior piriform rim on the cleft side, the widening of the piriform rim on the cleft side, the deflection of the anterior nasal spine and nasal septum to the opposite side uh, of the affected um, uh, cleft side. Uh, there's also absence of teeth uh, in that area commonly. Notice that the cleft, the osseous defect is always wider at the nasal side compared to the alveolus. Next, please. So we want to keep in mind that the bone graft is being placed for five different reasons. There are functional reasons associated with it, but there are also aesthetic reasons. We're attempting to reconstruct as much symmetry to the face as is possible with these bone grafts. I like to use fresh autogenous cancellous bone. Uh, about 10 years ago, bone morphogenic protein was introduced. It's commercially uh, available. Some centers are using it uh, instead of fresh autogenous bone. Um, uh, it is not FDA approved yet for patients under the age of 18, but it can certainly be used as an off-label uh, off product. Allogeneic and xenographic bone, I don't like to use whatsoever. Some people use it and claim success. Um, I have not had good success with it. The, the, the bottom line is that the gold standard still remains fresh autogenous cancellous bone. I like to harvest it from the ileum. Next, please. So again, the, the principle is a three-layer closure, construction of a new nasal floor using the tissue lining the cleft, then packing the bone into the defect and reconstructing not just the alveolus, the lateral wall of the maxilla and the floor of the nose. Next, please. I like to use cancellous bone, fresh autogenous cancellous bone harvested from the ileum. Next, please. And then I will also use small pieces of cortical bone harvested from the ileum to help support the nasal floor and the um, illustrate or the photograph on the lower left side demonstrates that graph that will be placed into the nasal floor to support the newly constructed mucosal tissue. Those graphs, by the way, um, are perforated to allow the ingress of uh, uh, blood vessels to help revascularize the bone graft quickly. Um, the top portion of that left. Uh, photograph indicates the bone that I would use, the cortical bone that I would use to reconstruct the ala rim that would span from the anterior nasal spine to the lateral aspect of the piriform uh, rim uh, to help support uh, the nasal cartilages and to help provide um, symmetry to the upper lip. Next, please. The final phase of bone grafting requires 
um, bringing tissue to in to cover over the bone graft. These small mucosal flaps, uh, I, rotational flaps, I find to be very helpful. Uh, and in some situations, we use sliding full thickness mucoperiosteal flaps, which uh, will allow you to bring fixed gingival tissue into the reconstruction as well. Next, please. So this is a, an eight-year-old with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. She has all of the typical stigmata. She has all of the typical dental findings, including an oral nasal fistula. Uh, as you can see, she has orthodontic appliances in place with some preliminary treatment uh, taking place. By the way, I operated this patient in the late 1970s. Next, please. We placed the bone graft in her cleft defect. As you can see, she has a deciduous lateral incisor that has an orthodontic appliance on it. If you look very carefully, you can see the cuspid tooth up in the cleft area. Uh, it's quite horizontal and it's tucked behind the premolars. And then there's a developing uh, supernumerary tooth above that deciduous lateral. Uh, uh, incisor on the cleft side. Next, please. Uh, this is that same patient at about 16 years of age uh, after she's completed orthodontic treatment. As you can see, what the orthodontists have done um, is to advance her cuspid adjacent to the central incisor. They've reshaped it some. A premolar has been uh, used to substitute for the cuspid. Complete elimination of, of the fistula on, on the cleft side. And you'll also notice permanent retention in the area. Next, please. If we look at that some, same patient, uh, and this is just a radiograph demonstrating the, the maturation of the bone graft and good periodontal support. Next, please. If we look at the patient and complete maturation, this is her, by the way, at age 36. Um, you can see a pretty nice result with significant reduction of the stigmata of cleft lip and palate, well-supported uh, upper lip, decent symmetry um, to the nose, and a uh, minimal scar uh, across the uh, upper lip. Very importantly, low maintenance dentition, complete closure of oral nasal fistulas, no need for a prosthesis. Next, please. Carol Ann, do you want to take this or do you want me to do the summary here? This is yours. Okay, so in children, Bone graft construction of the cleft maxilla and palate is primarily driven by orthodontic needs. So we use cancellous bone in, in the area. In adults, it's entirely different. The, the reason for bone grafting in adults is for uh, support of endosseous implants. And so we would tend to use cortical cancellous bone as a block as opposed to just cancellous bone alone. The other important thing that distinguishes adults is that they require more, more robust soft tissue flaps that are capable of revascularizing the bone graft compared to children who seem to have better endosteal revascularization potentials. Next, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, as I said before, once you finish the bone graft, you want to get out that phase one of orthodontics, you wanna fit your patient with a retainer and get out and give them a rest. But during that time as they're growing, if you see that the child's developing a class three, is there anything you can do? And I call your attention to, um, you all know Dr. DeClerc and his work on the bone plates and this particular study um, with uh, Nguyen and uh, Severanis. Um, and others as well, Cornelius, et cetera. Um, what he did here, this is, these are normal patients, okay? But I want to bring this to your attention. Obviously he pays, placed the, the plates in the infrazygomatic crest of the maxillary buttress and in the mandible between the 
lateral and the central incisors bilaterally. And they followed 25 consecutive, consecutively treated cases. They were growing patients around 11 years of age and they had class three elastics run for one to two years. Um, strength was about 250 grams or so. And what they found was for each patient, the zygomatic and infraorbital regions were displaced forward by about 3.5 to 4 millimeters. And that was significantly more than untreated class 3 patients and those treated with our standard face mask therapy. And in contrast to the face masks, there was minimal counterclockwise rotation of the maxilla and no posterior rotation of the mandible. But most importantly, they got an orthopedic effect around the circumaxillary sutures with the greatest opening at the transfer pa transverse palatine sutures. So what does this have to do with the cleft patients? Well, if your, class, if your cleft patient is turning to class, going into class three, this is what Dr. Kukluk has started a pilot study with patients at Beru Cleft Center at the University of Sao Paulo. And his preliminary findings demonstrate a similar orthopedic outcome in the cleft patients, as was observed in the non-cleft patients, despite the scarring from the palate repair. And this is a, a patient of Dr. de Klerk's, courtesy of Dr. de Klerk, a bilateral cleft lip and palate adolescent, cleft patient. You can see the mid-face deficiency there, long face. If you look intraorally, he's got scarring on the palate and anterior palatal fistula. And what he does here, you see the, the uh, class three elastics in place and the bone plates together with the bone plates. And he tends to put in a, um, a plate attached to the maxilla to jump the bite. And he over treats these patients. He has the patient at the end of treatment, much fuller mid face. And he over treats these patients almost to a class two and then treats them orthodontically there. So this is very promising again, before and after above, before, below, after. But there's some important questions with, it, with this that we need to have answered. And that is, what is the magnitude of the dental versus skeletal correction in the cleft palate patients? And which patients would most benefit from this treatment? Are there predictors for success? What are the growth expectations for the maxilla following the th this therapy? And the expectations for relapse? relapse? That is, how much do you overcorrect? And is there an optimal or cutoff age for the therapy? So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the RED device, the rigid external distraction device, briefly to mention this. This was um, first used by Figaro and Pauli um, probably about 20 years ago. And what this is, is a very rigid um, halo that's uh, rigidly fixed to the cranial vault. And you, you have the reverse pull kind of setup headgear, reverse pull headgear setup, where you place traction on the maxilla. What the surgeon does is he goes in and makes a high level, does a high level of forward cut. And over a six week period, the mid face is distracted forward. Well, there are some studies on this. The bottom line is it works. It's difficult to evaluate the extent of relapse with this because the patients are all a mismatch of patients in these studies. But it may be that in the future, bone plates may eliminate the need for this RED device. On the other hand, we may see creative combinations of appliances, as Tim will briefly discuss here with one of his patients. This is a young man who has ectodermal dysplasia. And as a result of that, he has uh, uh, um, uh, many missing permanent teeth, a very, very hypoplastic uh, mid-face. He has a bilateral cleft uh, lip and palate, which is compounding the, the problem of ectodermal dysplasia. As you can see from the lateral staphylometric radiograph, this patient's mid-face is severely, severely retruded. I don't like to use a lot of distraction osteogen or uh, distraction uh, techniques, uh, but I do feel that patients like this are better candidates for this um, than, than the typical cleft lip and palate patient. Next, please. So rather than use unsightly um, head frames and external devices, there are a number of transoral devices that have been developed uh, for distraction purposes. 
Uh, I did a very high level Lafort 1 osteotomy on that patient. We placed intraoral distractors in place. And as you can see, we were able to achieve a reasonable amount of advancement, but we didn't get him entirely out of crossbite. So we did a second round of distraction on that same patient. Next, please. Uh, and moved him even further forward. Next, please. And at, at the end of treatment, we were able to satisfactorily get his maxilla forward uh, greater than, than three centimeters uh, and left the distractors in place while he underwent complete consolidation. We eventually took the uh, uh, distractors off. He had good bone formation. And we left them in a position to now where he uh, is, is a candidate for prosthetic rehabilitation. Next, please. But I think you can appreciate the significant mid-face changes that have taken place with that amount of distraction. And importantly, we uh, have, have brought him into the realm of at least prosthetic uh, rehabilitation. Next, please. So the, those who advocate distraction uh, uh, feel that the major benefit is reduction of the need for bone graft. I don't find harvesting bone to be a terrible issue. Um, granted, it's a little more invasive, but um, uh, I feel that the benefits of surgery are, are much greater than putting a patient through a lot of distraction osteogenesis. It's very dependent on the planning. The vectors of distraction are a key with the success. Uh, it does take a, a lot of patient cooperation and parental involvement, especially with younger patients. Next, please. Okay. If, if you have, um, if you didn't do anything during that adolescent period, you're now going to see your patient again for the second phase of orthodontics. And if growth has been good as in our poster, poster patient here, then you're straightforward. You do your orthodontics and you finish things up. If growth hasn't been good and you haven't intervened during that time, which is what most people tend to do, you, get, uh, you, you see a patient like this, this young lady, this young girl, actually, she's 13 and a half years old at this point. You can see the mid-face, the concave um, profile with this severe mid-face deficiency. She's been prepared for orthognathic surgery, as you can see here, she's an anterior open bite, um, and she has canine substitution, and the premolar is gonna serve as the canine, and you're gonna have to do some tooth adjustments. Nonetheless, she's nicely set up. Here she is before the surgery, and here she is after the surgery. You see the nice fullness to the face that uh, was achieved with the maxillary advancement. Again, after the surgery, nice full facial mid-face and a nice occlusion. Before, above, after, below. And here she is um, in her 20s, and this is held up very nicely. Nice full face, good support to the ALA base, some mild asymmetry here, but a very nice occlusion. So Tim, how did you do this? So I, I want to emphasize that this patient underwent uh, bone grafting at age seven. Um, we closed the fistula that she had, the orthodontist meticulously de helped develop the maxillary arch with cuspid substance for the missing lateral incisor. Uh, he did not attempt to compensate for her mid-face deficiency. Uh, he aligned her teeth and um, eventually we proceeded with Lafour one level um, uh, operation. That was conducted at age 13 and a half. And many of you are probably sitting there being critical of operating on the mid-face of a 13 and a half year old, but we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. The point I want to emphasize here is that the surgeon needs to be somewhat creative with the type of osteotomy design he needs and design that Lafort one osteotomy so that you're providing optimum support for the parts of the face that require it. So asymmetrically designed operations 
methods, especially in the cleft patient, are, um, are more the norm for me th than uh, compared to uh, our regular denofacial population. Keep in mind that there is always concavity on the side of the cleft, concavity to the lateral wall of the maxilla compared to the opposite side, which is usually convex. Next, please. So asymmetrical design of the operation. For the four, one level uh, procedures in a unilateral cleft, I use a circumvestibular incision. For bilateral clefts, I will always maintain an anterior pedicle um, coming into the premaxilla, whether they've had a previous bone graft or not. I feel it's important to maintain as much blood supply coming into those segments. It makes the operation a lot harder. On the other hand, it, it's a belt and suspenders approach to preserving uh, the premaxilla. Next, please. So here is just an example of that anterior pedicle remaining um, on the premaxilla. You cannot do a down fracture um, with, when you leave these anterior pedicles. And so it makes the operation more difficult, but it certainly keeps more blood flowing into that premaxilla, which is critical. Next, please. So the other important thing that I want to emphasize is it's not just anterior displacement of the maxilla that allows you to achieve the type of result that you just saw, but it's additional onlay bone grafting to help contour the face. In that particular patient, we highlighted her cheeks on both sides. We also highlighted the um, uh, paranasal region and uh, the piriform aperture region. Uh, region uh, with autogenous uh, bone. Uh, and we also use autogenous bone grafts um, in the osteotomy defects themselves. Next, please. So um, this just emphasizes the point that the anatomy of the lateral wall of the maxilla in the cleft patient is very asymmetrical on the cleft side. It's always concave on the non-cleft side, it's convex. So what you want to do is to design the operation accordingly, but also to contour the maxilla once you advance it. Next, please. I like to use split thickness cranial bone at the time of uh, orthognathic surgery, especially in our cleft population. This bone um, contours very nicely to the cheeks. Uh, it's, it's very dense bone um, and it, it holds up very well uh, long-term. Next, please. Construction of the piriform rim at the time of orthognathic surgery is another important um, uh, uh, point that I want to emphasize. The, the goal here is function and aesthetics, and we're trying to produce as symmetrical a face as is possible by supporting the, the soft tissue with good bone support. Next, please. So the, the principles that I want to emphasize is that all osteotomies have to be performed completely. And next, please. We need to mobilize the maxilla. Mobilization uh, means that we have to uh, uh, advance the maxilla and put it in the splint and have it stay in that splint as passively as possible. With the down fracture procedure that we would do with a unilateral cleft, stripping all of the mucoperiosteum off the nasal floor, allows you to close any residual defects between the mouth and the nose. And it also eliminates some of the heavy scarring that will tend to reduce the amount of mobilization possible. Next, please. Um, so uh, the other point that I want to make is, is that sometimes we need to advance the cheeks more than the dental portion of the maxilla to, to give better projection. And so simultaneous mobilization of the maxilla and mandible uh, 
with clockwise rotation, occlusal plane rotation uh, can help facilitate that. As you can see in this particular patient where we did bimaxillary surgery, we brought her maxilla forward, but we also changed the occlusal plane so that the cheeks came further forward than the dental part of her maxilla. Also, genioplasty I find to be a very helpful procedure in many of our cleft patients um, uh, to help complement their facial features. Next, please. So this is an example of the benefit of bimaxillary surgery with clockwise rotation of the face to help facilitate greater advancement of the cheeks than of the dental portion of the maxilla and additionally, how nicely a, a genioplasty can help with the balance of the face. From a functional standpoint, we want to achieve uh, a decent amount of overjet so that the orthodontist can complete the detailing of the case. But keep in mind, the other very important thing here is the aesthetic aspects of what we're trying to do with our skeletal surgery. So it's a matter of mobilizing and, and placing the maxilla where you want it, use contour bone grafting, and use mandibular surgery when necessary. Next, please. Relative to the timing of surgery, as I mentioned earlier, we operated that redheaded patient at age 13 and a half. That's young, that's, uh, we expected the patient would be, remains somewhat immature, but her primary diagnosis is mid-face deficiency. I will always allow the patient and the parent to decide about the timing of surgery, but they are all cautioned that um, if we operate at a younger age, there's always a possibility that they will outgrow their correction and require additional surgery later in life. I base my my, my philosophy on the fact that I am much more attuned to psychosocial concerns, uh, and I feel that that's much more important than my biological concern about them outgrowing their correction. Next, please. Uh, Tim, um, can I just, uh, is sure. we have 10 minutes left, and I don't know... Um, Dan, do you want us to continue or would you like us to stop and take questions? Well, you know, how long do you guys have? How long do we have? Yeah, yeah. Left. Well, why don't we finish here? Uh, yeah, that's and, fine. And let's open it up to questions. Yeah. Great, great. So, questions. Let me get back to. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to uh, reverberate <laughs> the audience comments uh, on a, an excellent and very well coordinated presentation by both of you guys. I think it was very informative. A lot of thank yous in the question. So uh, first couple of questions uh, I had, we had is, um, how long do you wait before uh, moving the teeth after grafting immediately or three or four months? And do you recommend forced eruption of the teeth right next to the cleft after grafting or wait for the tooth eruption? So I, I'm a big advocate of the orthodontist beginning to move teeth into that newly grafted bone as quickly as possible, within two or three weeks, four weeks, whenever the child is comfortable enough to have uh, uh, engagement of wires. I'm not a big fan of forcefully uncovering teeth. I would much rather that we allow nature to take its course very careful observation will tell us if the teeth are going to erupt down into the cleft. If they require surgical guidance, then I will do it later. Um, but I wanna see what nature will allow happen before we begin a lot of, of forceful uncovering. 
So um, I, I agree, uh, we, about three weeks, and it's true if the patient is able to tolerate moving the teeth, then you start. Um, you know, I, I'm not frightened to go after the canine or the lateral if it doesn't erupt. And there's stuff, information in literature that says a certain number of them will not erupt. But yes, you should give it time to erupt. And, and then um, you can go after it if you need to. But Dr. Tovey, I agree 100% with Dr. Tovey. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's been my experience that very, very few patients um, that we've done here will require surgical uncovering uh, of their teeth. I agree with what Carol Ann said, that there are a certain percentage of patients where they need to be uncovered. My point is very careful observation uh, is necessary afterwards. You can't just complete this procedure and see the patient three years later. Thank you. Azan? Uh, okay. Thank you very much for a perfect presentation. Uh, one question is about, is primary graft done in all or just severe cases? I'm sorry, is primary grafting done in, repeat All that? cases or just, all, in all cases or just severe it's cases? It's not done. It's not done. Either, you either do, so I, it's always good to clarify this. You either do primary bone grafting or secondary bone grafting. Right now, state of the art is secondary alveolar bone grafting. So you don't do a primary graft if you're planning to do a secondary graft, which is what most, well, the studies bear this out, that secondary bone grafting is, prob, is your most contemporary approach. Most centers do not do primary alveolar bone grafting. But if you find a center that does, then if they did that bone graft, they should not need to do a secondary bone graft. That means if they have to do a secondary bone graft, the primary graft was a failure, okay? So you don't really do primary bone grafting. Most places don't. The only thing that's still out there is a gingival perioplasty, which some tenses do. And I think Dr. Turvey said that quite nicely in, the in his portion of the talk when he said that, that you know, as far as he sees that those that do have prime gingival periplasty, they need to go back in and do another graft. You shouldn't have to do that. Uh, and another uh, doctor is asking if there is any correlation between cleft palate and apnea. That we know of, there's no direct association of obstructive sleep apnea with, with cleft palate. Cleft palate repair, of course, has, has the possibility of uh, um, uh, producing some constriction in the nasopharynx. We do know that superior um, pharyngeal flaps are associated with the development of sleep apnea, as, as is any palatoplasty procedure, but it's not directly related to left lip and palate, it's related to the repair. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Dan, would you like to ask or do you yeah, want me to ask? Sure. Uh, how long do you wait to start expansion after bone grafting? You should, uh, you can put that back in right after. You know, what, what some places do is if you have a trihelix in place, what they'll do is you, you'll send your patient off to get the graft done, but you want to get that expander back in right after the graft or else the segments are gonna collapse. So you need to maintain that expansion. And part of what we were talking about is that there's some tension on that graft that enhances the graft viability. So if you, if you continue to just maintain that, that's very good for your patient. So that should be put back in as soon as the patient can tolerate it right after the graft. You might have some mild collapse, you just get it back, regain it. I, I agree with that. I, I'd, I'd encourage three or four weeks at the most. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Daniel. Uh, well, let me, I'm let me use this one there uh, for the surgeon. Uh, okay. What about using membranes uh, when grafting or PRP or PRF? Uh, yeah, it, um, the, the question has to do with, do you do something in addition to bone grafting? Do you put a membrane in? I, I don't. Uh, 
I don't use PRP uh, on a routine basis, maybe in some older patients, but not in the children. I find the most predictable thing uh, in children is fresh autogenous cancellous bone. Okay, one of my colleagues from Turkey uh, is asking, if you decide to do early orthognatic surgery, what's the earliest age for boys with cleft and palate? Okay, so the question has to do with the age of surgery. Again, I, I go back to the argument that I pay much closer attention to psychosocial concerns than my biological concern. Um, if you have an 11 year old, then I would suggest to them that maybe the orthodontist slow down the preparation, take a little more time to get them ready. 13, 14, 15, yes, um, but don't delay it until they're 17 or 18 because of your biological concerns. But 13, 14, 15, I think is a, a reasonable time frame. Everybody matures at a little a little greater rate, but again, this is only done when the parent and the patient acknowledge that they understand that they could require additional surgery at complete maturation if they outgrow their correction. There are some questions about distraction protocol. I mean, distraction of alveolar segments. It's also uh, one of my questions to you, Dr. Turi. Uh, what do you think about distracting uh, alveolar segments, neighboring cleft area to close the cleft? Yeah, um, I, I tend to rely more on the orthodontist to help develop the maxillary arch and to advance cuspids adjacent to uh, central incisors. In the adult patient, if there are large defects in, in the alveolus, then I tend to operate them rather than to rely on distraction. To me, I, it's a more precise way of accomplishing uh, the goal of trying to close the space down, reducing the need for prosthetic rehabilitation. There's nothing wrong with distraction. It's just that it, it, it's expensive. It requires a good bit of time and it requires a good bit of, of patient cooperation. Okay. Dan? Well, uh, I'd be remiss not to ask that question from an esteemed colleague of mine in Montreal, uh, Dr. Madeleine Schilkraut, uh, who spent uh, more than 20 years at the Montreal, Montreal Children's Hospital. She's asking, in bilateral cases where the anterior overbite was extremely deep, she would use uh, partial bracketing in the upper arch to level the arch before surgery. And the brackets were kept during the surgery and a splint was placed post-surgery. Once the splint was removed, the placement of new wire permitted stabilization of the anterior segment as the graft yield and bone fill was occurring. What are your thoughts regarding this technique? Uh, so I, I think as long as, yes, I think as long as you have premaxillary stability. Okay, I'll tell you from an orthodontic perspective. One, you work closely with your surgeon, okay? Because the last thing you want is to have failure and particularly in a bilateral. One of the things I heightened was the fact that your first shot at any surgery is your best. You don't want to have repeated surgeries because that ends up being detrimental to the patient. So you really, particularly in bilaterals, you need to work closely with your surgeon to figure out how you're going to stabilize that premaxilla. And if you're both comfortable, particularly with the approach just she, she's described there, which is hard to picture, but as long as there's not interference, I think you probably would be fine. Um, I'm not sure, she's not talking about a premaxillary osteotomy, which I said you should avoid only in right. As long as you and your surgeon are comfortable with the stabilization, and most people use um, a splint at the end to stabilize that premaxilla, that's great. You don't want to have a failure and to have to go back in again. Tim? Um, I, I think the basic principle is, is that we don't want any mobility to the premaxilla when you're trying to get the bone graft to heal. And so whatever you can do, whatever me uh, orthodontic mechanics you can use to help stabilize the position of that premaxilla 
keep it at a traumatic occlusion. This is the principle. If you have to use some bite opening device or an O36 auxiliary wire or whatever to help stabilize that pre-maxilla, the principle is it has to remain still. It cannot be in traumatic occlusion. Otherwise, you will not get healing of the graft. Thank you. Um, if skeletal expansion is needed, what is the risk of using skeletally exp uh, anchored expanders uh, in cleft patients, in adult patients? Any concerns regarding the clefted bone segments repair? Would you suggest bone anchored expansion in cleft cases? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, bone anchor expansion is a great indication, um, but you're fighting scar tissue uh, the entire time, and the bone anchor will take some pressure off the teeth. It will allow you to expand the segments, but you might open some fistulas there that will require closure once you have achieved adequate expansion of the arch. Well, at this point, one more question. If the fistula is not closed for a while after surgery, what are the procedures to follow? If the fistula is not closed for a while after surgery, what are the procedures to follow? Yeah. Then, then I, I would encourage that an attempt be made to close those fistulas once you have achieved adequate width of the arch. And the, the procedure that would be used would be a three layer closure, reforming the new nasal floor with tissues aligning the fistula, um, insertion of either bone or some type of